I'm Jesse. And I'm Josh. And this is a show all about saving the best and burning the rest. And the times when I can do or say something that makes Jesse silently look at me and shake his head, I know that this episode is already going well. It, it's not It's not that what you did, it's the way you did it. It's <laughs> when, when Josh, it's like he was winding up to, I don't know, blow, explode or something like the welcome. that. Welcome. Welcome has to be explosive or no one cares. Well, you are an explosive person, Josh. What can I say? Thank you. I appreciate that much, Lee. It's what I strive to be in life, among many things. You shouldn't, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm joking. That was that was sad. It was a sad thing to say. It's okay. I can take it. I'm looking, we're sitting in one of Jesse's offices because he has multiple offices he can work in. Uh, looking this at is some my personal boardroom. His personal boardroom with a giant TV that keeps turning on and off. There, there's a camera just underneath the, the TV that I think is watching us. Big Brother is always watching. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Some beautiful gum trees outside. Yeah. It's a good time. Yep. This is an accurate description of where we are. I feel relaxed. I just, I honestly, this is a very relaxing Yeah. But the, the temperature in here is quite, it's not too cold, it's not too hot, mm. and it's, it's nice. Yep. It's very nice. There is carpet. A wooden table. All right. You're going to dox us if you keep talking. You know. <laughs> Must remain secret. I don't know. Secret recording locations. You'll yeah. never know where we're going to record You'll next. You'll never know. Uh. Anyway, so Josh, you a few weeks ago were talking to me about a book, a book that many of us in the Christian male demographic read when we were becoming teenagers, mm. a book that was everywhere in the evangelical Christian world that took the world by storm. True. And to this day, it also has a, also has a, a partner book, as it were, for the ladies. So yes. there's one for men, there's one for the ladies. Mm-hmm. To this day, my wife will say that the, 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 the ladies' version is the only book that's ever made her cry. Wow, really? It was that impactful. Wow. The male version made me cry, won't lie. There you go. First time I read it. I don't Mm. know if I have feelings, so I can't say that I cried. I have never seen you cry. I think we've talked about this once on the show before. No one has seen you cry. Green has never seen me cry. It's because you just don't cry. Yeah. Mm. (laughs) It's not true, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Should get that checked out, man. (laughs) (laughs) You're broken tear ducts. (laughs) So, of course, I'm talking about Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. Eldridge? Eldridge. Eldridge? I don't. I've never been able to figure out what his surname is. Now that you mention it, it's got an E. I thought it was an I. I thought it was Eldridge, but maybe it is Eldredge. Anyway, so John, the old John of the Eldridge, um, (laughs) he wrote a book in the, I want to say late 90s, but I'm not 100% sure when it was written. Let me check. It should be in the 2001. Okay, so early 2000s, Mm -hmm. 2001, A Space Odyssey. John wrote <laughs> Wild at Heart, and I believe he and his wife co-wrote Captivating, the yes. partner book for this. And this is a book that took the world by storm, the Christian world at least. Yeah, man, like me and everyone read it. Yeah. Especially like that first year I was at college. Like I, yes. I, that was like, yeah, we were all just, everybody knew it. Everybody had read, all the boys had read it. Well, most of the boys had read it, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> the ones um, who could read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, it's basically, if you haven't heard of it before, I'd be surprised. But if you haven't, I guess maybe now it's a bit older. So maybe I don't think it's, audience. Yeah, yeah, I don't think it's really in the cultural zeitgeist anymore, but I think its effect is still in the cultural zeitgeist, which we're going to talk about a bit more. Yeah, so the book Wild at Heart, subtext, Discovering the Secret of a Man's Soul, essentially a book all about masculinity, what it means to be a man, mm. sort of the problems that men are facing. Um, and Captivating is essentially the same sort of thing, but for women. Yeah. I have never read Captivating. I yeah. should. I know you sh- you're supposed to read both, but I... I have never read Captivating either. Yeah. I would like to. I, I'm currently... I've been rereading Wild at Heart. And so I think this might be the time when I take the dive and, and do Captivating okay. as well. Because I hear it's good. I hear it's really good. But yeah, it's an interesting book. It has lots of interesting points about what it, what 
I guess John's idea of being a man is, and it's something he's like done a lot of work into. He has multiple books around this kind of thing, but this is definitely like the the book. Yeah, it's the one he's most well known for. Yeah. I read that and then I immediately, only a few months later, read his other book, which is called, I believe, Beautiful Outlaw, mm. which is the I don't I don't I don't want to say it was sort of trying to jump on the Philip Yancey Jesus I Never Knew bandwagon, but it's all about Jesus, mm-hmm. the the man, the myth, the legend. The him, beautiful outlaw. The beautiful outlaw. Mm. And yeah, so I was very much a fan of John Eldridge growing up. As you say, if you're a man and you were a Christian, most people just shoved the book in your face and said, here, you have to read this. It's mandatory. Yeah. Uh, mandatory. <laughs> ah! <laughs> uh, yeah. So I read it many years ago. I, there are still bits and pieces of it that I remember. However, you know, I haven't read it recently. So you'll have to maybe if people haven't read it, you can fill them in a little bit more. But we're not here to review the book necessarily because you reading the book did kind of springboard into a greater conversation about masculinity and what it means to be a man, specifically what it means to be a Christian man, but, but just also masculinity in, in general. And that's a conversation that we've been having and that that's what this episode is all about. Yeah. And look, this is something I'm still wanting to learn a lot more about. So I don't know, maybe we'll, maybe we'll revisit this. I don't know, but yeah, I, Basically, I want to give a bit of context for why I've been looking into this. I think when I read this, what it meant to be a man or what masculinity meant, I think the world was a very different place even 10 years ago. Yeah. And I think particularly when it comes to issues around gender, for obvious reasons. And so I think now I'm, I've been looking out and working as well in a sort of education setting having a lot more conversations with teachers, educators, mm. um, just in general people who work with young people. And again, we've talked about this in some of, that, from some of our episodes, but there are some issues with our young people at the moment, mm. as there are in every generation. But the big concern that I'm seeing and, you know, shared with some teachers is that in school, like boys are falling behind. And this is not just high school. It's like hitting college as well or like mm. university in the workplace. A lot of men are, you know, not working or sort of giving up. Yeah, there's a big sort of, I guess, malaise around mm-hmm. a lot of men. Yeah, and, you know, some people are calling it like the, the man crisis or whatever at the moment yeah. or the boy crisis. There's a book called The Boy Crisis, which I'd like to read. I haven't read it yet. Essentially, we're seeing a lot of issues around what's happening to men. And I guess I want to preface this by saying like some people get annoyed at others when we talk about men <laughs> because they're like, no, we have to keep talking about about women because, you know, we've got to, we've got to, you know, fix all the, and like, don't get me wrong. I am a hundred percent on board with like fixing the, the, you know, I want equality between, between genders, men, women to have equal opportunity to men, all that kind of thing. And I love like workplaces and all that kind of thing with both men and women in it. But what we've been seeing is that men for a whole lot of reasons at the moment, just sort of, I guess, falling behind. Mm. Um, and, I don't know. I, I saw some dialogue around this online and someone was just like, well, it's about time. Just like laughing, but they, you know, they didn't care. But I, I don't know. I feel like I, isn't the whole reason we care about any of this is because we care about human flourishing. Yeah. You know, <laughs> equity and equality, all that sort of thing. You can't be on one team and be against the other team. I mean, if you're for human flourishing, you, you can't be for women and against men. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, this is where this is coming from. There's a really interesting, a really interesting book. I haven't read the whole thing. Again, I just, I have to keep having that <laughs> caveat. Just let me make sure I get the title right. I'm just, just Googling it now, but I've been, you know, watching some videos from the guy reading some, mm. some parts of it. I'm about to read the whole thing. Oh, my internet stopped working. So I love that. I believe the book is called Of Boys and Men by yes. author Richard Reeves. Yeah. And he has some like hectic outlines like we're like real hard data of areas mm. in life where men are falling behind and like the percentages and stuff. And yeah, Jesse and I were just watching, he does a little, a little bit of a summary of it on YouTube. You can watch. And he talked about how like even with college, was it college education or co- obtaining college degrees Yeah, in the late seventies, there was a gap between, I think 
men were 12% more likely to get a degree than women. Yeah, it was either 12 or 13%, whereas nowadays it's reversed in the opposite direction where women are now 15% more likely to obtain a degree than, than their male counterparts. Yeah, so there's a gender gap, but it's like the opposite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is like, whoa, like that's crazy. That's it's kind of amazing that there's been that much cultural change. It is, it is. Before we go to that, and I, obviously that's going to be the bulk of our episode, could I just quickly, could we quickly talk about the setting in which the John Eldridge book was written compared to now? Because I was thinking about 2001 to 2023. So that's a 22 year difference. Yeah, right? wow. So that, there's been an entire generation of men that have grown up and entered the workforce, gone through the education system, et cetera, since just that book was written. So I think it's fair to say that the generation that potentially could pick up that book today is different to the generation that book was originally intended for. Yeah. Right? Well, 2001, there was no Facebook yet. Yep. No social media, no smartphones. The internet was basically non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> At least in my little country town in Australia it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But beyond just that, I mean, think about where 2001 is in like world history. We've just gone through the 90s, mm. one of the pe most peaceful and prosperous, at least for the West, decades in human existence. I mean, you've had the 80s before that, the 70s, the 60s. You've had the end of the Cold War. You know, you've got the sort of humdrum boredom that is that kind of came part and parcel with the 90s. And then in 2001 you have the shock of the Twin Towers, you know, falling. Mm. Suddenly the world, which was very safe, very cosy, and in many cases really boring, is suddenly thrown into chaos. And obviously if the book was published in 2001, Eldridge didn't have any idea about any of that happening. But mm. that's, that's the cultural zeitgeist that was happening yeah. after the publication of the book. Yeah. So you can see how the themes of the book of, you know, heroism, slaying the dragon, rescuing the princess type themes that I vaguely remember. Oh, yeah, 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 you yeah, can yeah, definitely yeah. We, fill we, it in we'll, a little we'll bit more. Yeah, yeah, we'll get yeah. to it. Yep, yep. Like those kind of, those themes definitely would not, would have resonated with that generation of men because it's like, okay, the world has suddenly gone from being very safe to being very dangerous. And so now there's more of a reason for me to want to, rise up to become a man that is going to be a protector, a provider, a hero mm. sort of figure. Yeah, wow. So, like, it's a very different world now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> only 20 years later, only two decades later. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. And church has changed. And I think, like, the way we see God has continued to grow and develop as the world's changed too. So, you know, in, in rereading it, it does feel at times a little bit like, wow, like I haven't heard people talk like this. You know what I mean? Like yeah. in a while, I didn't really think I'd feel like that. I thought, it, would, you know, it's not a bad book by any means, but there are just some parts where I've read it and I'm just like, wow, yeah, I forgot we used to talk like that. You know, in a way, <laughs> I don't know how to explain it, but yeah. Yeah. Like, and the book has some amazing things. Maybe I'll just run through them now. He has basically, well, three main things. And, you know, again, I would recommend read the book. Like I'm not going to yeah. give you the whole thing now, but he believes that every man needs a battle to fight, a beauty to rescue and an adventure to, to live. And he also talks a lot about like the idea of the wound as well, like that a lot of men are walking around with like wounds that they got from their fathers, whether it's things their father did or didn't do or like their absence. That chapter was mad emotional for yeah. <laughs> me and all my friends. Like, yeah, you know, just, yeah. it's crazy. And so like that stuff, I think those principles. I'm still kind of thinking about it. I don't know. Maybe I'd word it a little bit differently now, but I think he kind of, I think his understanding is good. When you read the book, it's real like, mm. talks about like hunting elk and all that kind of <laughs> stuff. So it feels super far removed. I'm from, pretty sure the dude lives in like, he still lives out in the forest in Colorado or something like that these days. I have no idea. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. And so I think sometimes some of that stuff gets, for me at least, gets a little bit in the way of reading the book because I feel like yeah. I'm so not that guy. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. But that's not, I think he, he doesn't necessarily say that those things are like what it means to be a man. He just yeah. uses those things because that's the life he lives and how he talks about masculinity, I guess. But I think it is easy to read a book like this and to feel all the ways that you are not the person that yeah. he is describing. You know, I think that that is, 
an unfortunate, perhaps, byproduct of the kind of culture that a book like this can potentially breed. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I've been thinking about, and I don't have an answer for this, but because it's like 20 years on and because the world is so different now and because there's been a whole generation of men who have grown up either reading the book or being influenced by the people who read the book Mm -hmm. in the Christian culture, what kind of culture has that produced? Mm -hmm. You know, like when I think of the church as a whole, has that affected the way that we've thought about men in a positive way, a negative way, or a little bit of both? Mm. Right, so I, I don't I don't have an answer for that, but yeah. I, you know I think it's maybe something that probably we'll explore as we go in through the episode. But yeah, I guess no, those are some really good points. I guess I hadn't really thought about the context that this was written, you know, just reading it. But yeah, ultimately, I think we are in a interesting time and a changing time, and you know, some of the changes have been really good, some changes questionable, but all are having effects on. You know, not just men, but all people really. Yeah. Like any change we bring on a societal level is always going to bring change and potential difficulties to anybody living in that. And I guess, as a man, as as fellow men, Jesse, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's something that it is a time when we probably I don't know. I just I guess I'm curious, not to like just to talk about some ideas that I'm going through and that we're we're going through, but also yeah. I guess to just start the conversation and hear from you guys listening, what does it mean yeah. to be a man? Like what does masculinity look like in mm. today's, what does healthy masculinity look like? Well, I think that a good place to start would be in the Richard Reeves book because he highlights three main areas where we're seeing a shift in masculinity. Yep. So the three areas I remember, I believe you said, was education, the workforce, and... So, yeah, uh, boys and men are struggling. Profound economic and social changes of recent decades have many losing ground in the classroom, the workplace, and in the family. While the lives of women have changed, the lives of many men have remained the same or even worsened. So those are the three areas, but I think when he gets into family, he talks about a whole lot of things. I'm sure he does. Yeah. (laughs) No, but I mean, like, he can branch into, like, why are fathers not present and that kind of thing? Yeah, Like, there's mental health issues. There's crime issues and all that kind of thing. There's violence. And so, and even a a big thing that a lot of people are talking about is a lot of men are just lacking a, maybe a deeper sense of purpose Mm. with, I guess, redefining gender roles Yep. and all that kind of thing in traditional gender roles. A lot of, there are men out there who are just struggling to think, well, what is my place in the current age? What does it look like to be a man? Because, you know, traditionally... It was, I'm the guy who works, I provide for my family, yeah. I look after them, I protect them. And, you know, the, the, the wife traditionally would look after the family, I guess from a nurturing perspective, like they'd be the mm. one to look after the house, to look after the kids and all that kind of thing. That's just not the world anymore, you know. No. And, like I'm, I'm happy to that, you know, there are more options for women and, all that, and, and for men too, like they're stay-at-home dads and that's a normal thing now too. And yeah, I mean, now both couples both kind of just have to work in order to survive. But I, yeah, I feel like that's a foregone conclusion now. There's no other option really yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I can like, this is not part of the episode, but I can just imagine how much more complicated this would be. If for instance, you are a transgender man or a transgender woman mm. in a couple, potentially thinking about having kids or starting a family in some way, shape or form, like how much more complicated does it become then? Because you're trying to not just fit into one pot- potential gender role but you're navigating multiple gender roles all at the same time yeah and i i guess as, as christians we're gonna have enormous compassion on people battling with any of this yeah you know it's massive it's it's complicated the world's so complicated one of the things that reeves talks about in in his book and in in the talk you can watch on youtube he he talks about yeah like we mentioned before with the education difference but even just in the workplace there are just a lot of workplaces now where men aren't very well represented. For example, in school, like again, talking about education, there's just not that many male teachers around, Mm. less and less. And mental health workers like psychologists and that kind of thing and counsellors, there just aren't as many male counsellors. And, and, you know, I like, I think diversity makes workplaces helpful. And if we're losing that, then it's something we, we have to talk about and it makes it harder, 
like as, as again, Ruth says in his book, it makes it harder for other men to follow in their footsteps, mm. you know, so it could be a perpetual problem. I, I guess it, there's worries and I don't like there's so many more problems and nuances to the problems than what we can ever mm. <laughs> accomplish in a podcast. But yeah, I guess what I'm interested in is maybe just, just working on thinking, well, what is masculinity and what is, mm. what is the Bible? Does the Bible say anything helpful around this topic? Right. Yeah. And does the church offer anything? Yeah. I guess the big things I'm thinking about. Yeah. Look, I think when I think of the Bible and masculinity, one of the, I guess, stereotypical things that pop out to me is like the heroic King David type, Mm -hmm. you know, who is the man Mm. in in many ways. Yeah. But I, I think as well, the ideals of, you know, he's the warrior, he's the poet, he's the lover, he's the, he's the man after God's own heart. Like, the man. He yeah. is the man in, in many ways. But the biblical story also portrays people like David, people like Abraham, people like these, you know, figures, these heroes of faith mm. in not just their best moments but also in their worst, you know, when they lie, when they cheat, when they have an affair with another man's wife and then murders that man. Yes. You know, like these are the things. So we see that masculinity is not just a problem right now, but it's been a problem ever since the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if it's just masculinity is the problem, but it's like the... the well, there pop- has been a problem with how men relate to their own oh. sense of self. Yeah, 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 sure. Like I guess that's when you get into toxic masculinity and that kind of sure. thing. Sure. But- Sure. Well, here's, a, here's something interesting, right? Let me ask you, mm. what is Proverbs 31 about? The greatest woman there ever was, apparently. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. We all, we talk often about a Proverbs 31. Some, I remember there was a thing early days of college, girls talk about like, I'm going to be a P31 kind of girl. You know? <laughs> it sounds like a drug. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, if yeah. you have that P31, it's the best. <laughs> but um, what if I was to tell you, Jesse? That the very beginning of Proverbs 31 is not about that at all. Wow. I would say I'm shocked because what's the point in reading the first part of the verse <laughs> that would contextualize the rest of the passage? There's yeah. no point. The legend, the legendary P31 wife of the, no, the noble wife character, <laughs> that starts at verse 10. There's a whole other nine verses before that. Wow. And it's actually the sayings of King Lemuel. Okay. Very well known. We all, all talk about oh. King Lemuel, what a guy, what King, a G. Yeah, King Lem. Yep. Like, what a bro. But he actually has this sort of like prayer and sayings, that the wisdom for his son. Mm. And he has this kind of idea of what, I guess, being a man looks like. Okay. And I, it's, it's con- that's what I find it interesting because it's contrasted so hectically to the, pe- the, can, the, the woman described in Proverbs 31. Okay. But it says this in verse one, the sayings of King Lemuel, an inspired utterance that his mother taught him. Listen, my son, listen, son of my womb. Listen, my son, the answer of my prayers. Do not spend your strength on women, your vigor on those who ruin kings. It is not for kings, Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, not for rulers to crave beer, lest they drink and forget what has been decreed and deprive all the oppressed of their rights. Let beer be for those who are perishing. (laughs) Wine, (laughs) it's kind of strange, but okay. Wine for those who are in anguish. Let them drink and forget their poverty and remember their misery no more. Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves, for the rights of all who are destitute. Speak up and judge fairly. Defend the rights of the poor and the needy. Wow. Yeah. So you get these sort of like three, yeah, if I was going to preach this, you get these kind of like <laughs> three big main ideas from this saying like from, from his mother, right? What, mm. Like what a man should look like. The first was just like, well, you know, like don't, waste all of your energy on chasing a woman. Like this right. is a huge problem we see today, right. right? That guys are trying to find their whole identity in a woman, right? right? And I'll say Wild at Heart talks about that really well in the book. Mm. Like you cannot find your identity and your meaning and purpose in just being with a woman. Mm. That's like not healthy. Mm. You actually need to already have that before you like meet, or like before you're trying to like get into a, a relationship or a marriage with a woman. You kind of already need to be secure in that. And they're saying it's like, it's, don't waste all of your energy on just trying to get with women. Yeah. Like how many guys do we know who like everything is about getting with women? Oh yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. And how yeah. many guys do we know who have such a, a high standard, a high bar for the woman that they are going to be there forever, you know, partner. And yet 
they don't even really me- measure up to the same standard that they're, <laughs> you know, yeah, trying wow. to compare these women to. Yeah, or even, I don't know, the unfortunate mess of guys who just treat women like another notch in the belt kind of thing. They're just right. trying to get with as many as they can. Yeah. And um, when you talk to them, like everything they do is for that. They want to get money mm. so that they can go out and, you know, like get the hookups on Tinder or whatever, or they right. want to get buff so that they look more appealing. Like it's, that's what it seems to all come down to. Yeah. And it's unhealthy. Yeah. Right. And so that's sort of the first part. And then it goes into, you know, drinking. And I guess you could apply that to self-control. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Like it's the idea that like, and don't, don't get addicted to substances. Don't drown your life away. Yeah. Like in, in alcohol or, you know, getting drunk and yeah. all that kind of thing, trying to numb the pain of life which is huge as well. Like how many guys do we know who are just constantly trying to escape life? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, you know, like I'm not immune to I think we all have these moments where we're just like, oh, I just need to watch a TV show and like get um, away from all this. Like We all live in a capitalist, consumeristic society. <laughs> yeah. Consumerism. Now that's a topic we could talk about. No, okay. yeah. I mean, um, look, the reality is that a lot of culture – tries to help to tell us that we need to be defined by what we consume, Mm. you know, whether it be the brand of beer that we drink or whether it be the women that we get with or the car that we drive or the type of house that we live in or whatever the case may be, you know, it would be very easy for, for me to feel less of a man because I like playing board games and not, I don't know, shooting deer. Or something. What, you don't like shooting deer in your spare time. What? I'm what not. Kind of <laughs> I'm not out on the lake on my jet ski every <laughs> every weekend. You know, I, whatever. Like, and hey, if you are into that, like, well, you know, we're just we're just making a joke. It's it's okay. Like, you can. <laughs> you are into, a real man. Yeah, it's you okay. Are, like, obviously, it's fine. <laughs> but yeah, no. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, and then the last one is about speaking up for the oppressed. Right. Like having the courage to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Mm. to bring justice. And I mean, how often is that the picture of masculinity, you know, that actually gets painted? Most of the time, and this is what drives me insane, masculinity is just, it just becomes an aesthetic. Mm. It's like, you know, it's the big muscular bearded lumberjack. Yeah. Or like the gym bro. (laughs) You know what I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or to open a can of worms, the Andrew Tate admirer. Yeah. I mean, like, we could spend an entire episode just talking about that, but I feel like that's in part the the elephant in the room here. Mm. It's not just him, but it's the culture around him. Well, yeah, this is one thing we haven't talked about. Yeah, I, I think a lot of young boy, boys and young men do not have good mentors in life. And yeah. so they're looking to anybody who seems like a good mentor, and that's when you come across someone like Andrew Tate. Yeah. You know, and so then. <sighs> I mean, we talked a little bit about this in the the, the Thrivers and Strivers episode. Mm. And I think a lot of it does come down to, it's all connected. It's all connected, man. <laughs> but it's, it's connect your, your financial state, yep. how much money you have is connected to your ability to, you know, be financially secure to, to buy what you want to have the type of partner that you want, which is connected to your lifestyle, which is connected to your happiness. And Mm -hmm. as we've learned, you know, consumerism tells us that time equals stuff equals money equals happiness, right? And so in order to be able to be the happiest that I can, I need to have lots of money, which will get me lots of stuff, which will give me more time. Mm. So Andrew Tate and men like him there are lots of them, by the way. There he, are. He's just become the sort of like figurehead. Is that he's the, the, he's the yeah. atypical, not the atypical. He's the archetypical male guru, financial <laughs> women well, lifestyle. Yeah, I mean, he talks, yeah, he's like he's like talks about how to get fit. Talks about like how to make money, all this kind of stuff. And like, I can see why a lot of young guys are turning to him. Like, yeah. you know, lots of teenagers who I speak to like him and they're like, you know, with all the stuff that he's been accused of, they're like, he's been framed and whatever. And wow. Just, yeah, wow. Okay. <laughs> like they are a hundred percent on board, but that's because that's what they, they need. They need this like mentoring role. Mm. And I think this is kind of what breaks my heart about this whole thing is because they're getting like these guys on YouTube are getting just millions of views. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's like, you know, some, sometimes they have some good things to say. Yeah. But I think it's important that we just say this. At least I'm saying this. 
most of these men at the end of the day are just grifters. Well, yeah, they've got a product they're trying to sell. They want to make money. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point, you know. And maybe they, you know, maybe some of these guys got into it for the right reasons. They genuinely wanted sure. to help people. It's possible. Know. It's possible. Yeah, I don't know. But like, I think this is, and this is the, this is the thing I think as, the, as church, as followers of Jesus, we need to have our eyes on. And also like, I don't know, I'm just putting this out there to just like men in the church. Like, I'm not saying you need to go up to, and we talked about this again with, our, with Darren Pratt, but like, you don't need to just like, go up to some kid and be like, I'm going to mentor you. But it's just like sure. learning their name, talking to some of these young guys and yeah. just like sharing about life together. That's hugely powerful. Like in the things that I've been reading about men, generally like the best way that men learn things is through like a mentoring process. Yep. Generally. Yeah. Obviously we're making generalizations here. It's about averages. It's not saying that every man only learns through mentoring, but it's the idea that, and this is kind of what has been lost as everybody in life has gotten busier and busier and busier and busier, there's less time for that intentional man-to-man male relationships of just like taking someone through life and talking to them. Like yeah. often you talk to, yeah. you know, some young tradies and like the, mm. the person who influences them the most if they're like an yeah. apprentice is the person they apprentice with, you know, mm. like if they're, if they're a carpenter or whatever, yeah. like and they've got like someone who they have to work with every day. They're out in the van driving around to all the jobs and they're just talking all the time. and Sometimes good things, sometimes bad things, you know, whatever. Yeah. But and I, and I think, imagine, I don't know, like, how can we be doing this today? Like, what can we be intentionally bringing to young men? And, and I don't know, I guess trying to help them figure out what, what does it look like today to be a healthy man? Why don't we talk a little bit more about the book? Yep. Okay. And let's talk about, I guess, some of the positive stuff yeah. that you have found in it and maybe some of the stuff that, we can move on for or some of the stuff that hasn't aged super well. I really actually like, I like, well, yeah, I do like the idea of the wound. We talked about that a little bit already, but yep. I like, I like in Wild at Heart, I like the big three ideas that, that he believes like is kind of like what every man needs. You know, firstly it's to, well, before the three, it's like healing the wound, but then it's just like a battle, a battle to fight and a beauty to rescue and an adventure to live. Okay. So if you could sum it up, like each yeah. of the points, what, how would you, in Josh translation, how would you summarize them? I think we, we like to approach challenges and overcome them. Okay. You know, I think men love the idea of overcoming challenges, but we are, I think we're all, the, the idea that in the, in, the, in the modern world now, we have realized that there's more than one challenge. The challenge is not just hunting an elk kind of yeah. thing, which is kind of, I would say that's something that, I don't know. The way I read it anyway, doesn't date too well with this book. It just kind of mm. feels like that's the challenge you've got to have. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know if he means it like that. That's just how it kind of came, came across. But, but I think this is why, like, you know, you love board games, right? Sure. Because there's a challenge to yeah. overcome every time. And that challenge is a puzzle. And figuring out the puzzle and how to overcome it is, in many ways, even more interesting and exciting than the end point. Yeah. Or like, um, you know, I love learning a piece of music with yeah. my guitar. And it's that idea that like I've come up to this challenge and I love to learn, like I'm, like I'm working out how do I need to move my fingers and stuff to be able to play this well. Mm. Or like even I just love learning new instruments because it's like how does this work and like wrapping your mind around it and you come up with this challenge and you want to you wanna overcome that. And I think, I think that's a beautiful trait in men. Now, obviously there are women who like, have that too but I just I don't know I see it more naturally present in just men like yeah. guys just like you look at little boys they just yeah. love like like I see it like with all like me and all my friends little kids like the boys are just totally different to the girls yeah. <laughs> like the, the boys just love to challenge their bodies and they yeah. jump and they run and all that kind of stuff whereas the girls just aren't naturally as inclined to do that for good reason. They have way less injuries. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. It's awesome. That's always a positive yeah, thing. Yeah, I love having a daughter. It's awesome. <laughs> and so I think men just love to overcome those challenges. Mm. And I think what's become, well, I, yeah, I guess, and I, I think this speaks really well to current culture because there's a whole lot of guys who I think are wasting their energy on, well, not, maybe not wasting energy. I don't know. Maybe that's a bit too harsh. But like, for example, like video games, yep. super addictive. And I think we use all of our energy that we would use on solving challenges. We're using it on 
solving video game challenges, mm. which again, are fun. I, you know, I enjoy, I, I love video games, but I had to consciously wind it back so that I could use that energy on other challenges. Like I'm trying to read more because I'm trying to like challenge myself to do new mm. things and to learn new skills. Or like even go and working out and doing like fitness stuff. I think that's why guys get so addicted to the gym because it's like the yeah. next challenge is that next set of weights. Yeah, yeah. You There's know always I mean? another mountain to conquer. Yeah. Or like even people who like to fix things. Like I've got a right. really good friend. He's like, like awesome with like engineering stuff and he just loves to fix stuff. That's his yeah. thing. He just gets, I don't know. He gets tinker. Soldering. Like, yeah, he just tinkers and he fixes it. I don't know who does amazing. Like, yeah. But that's just his challenge he likes to solve. Yeah. And, you know, I do have friends who like to go out and rock climb. You know, mm. and that's because that's just the challenge. They see this huge rock wall. And they're yeah. like, I'm going to climb that. Yeah. And it's beautiful. Yeah. And I think that's, that's what I think a lot of people have substituted that energy with things that aren't actually great in the long run. Not like, meaningful, not worthwhile. Not or in some cases, yeah, absolutely just like toxic. Yeah. Or bad for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's aged really well. I think that principle. Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Not to be a negative Nancy. You can be a negative Nancy. Well, no, you have to be a negative Ned. Thank you. Talk about masculinity. Thank it's you, male terms. Mel- fellow oh. man. <laughs> the one, the thing that really kind of jumped out to me with that is because I think the world is so much more complicated these days, or, or perhaps because of the internet and because of culture, there's much more of an awareness of how complicated the world is. Mm. There are a lot more problems, like big problems, that aren't easily solvable. Mm. Like we have become much more aware of systemic issues in our society that just don't have easy answers. Yeah. Whether it's systemic racism, whether it's the, the, the financial capitalist system, whether it's something as simple as being able to afford rent or put fuel in your car or purchase groceries. You know, I'm building a house right now and Woo. yeah, it's great, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the response you want. Yeah. Oh, well, it's stressful, <laughs> but there's so many things that I can't fix. And there's so many aspects to building a house that I wish that I could overcome, mm. but I just can't, whether that be rising interest rates, right. whether it be supply chain issues I think it was Mark Sayers who talks about this ages ago in the COVID world, how COVID changed the world or our perception of the world from being complex to complicated, or it may have been the other way around. Basically, on the one paradigm, there are problems, but we can overcome them if we're clever enough, if we put enough money into it, if we put enough research into it, anything is possible. We can overcome anything Mm -hmm. to suddenly COVID comes, supply chains shut down communications shut down, travel shuts down. We have a virus in our world that we cannot, you know, treat because we don't have an, you know, a vaccine for it in the first, you know, whatever it was, 12 months, 16 yeah, months yeah. of its existence. Suddenly we have a problem that we cannot overcome. We can minimize the amount of people who die from the virus, but we can't prevent people from dying if they get infected and don't have access to the required medical treatment, right? So. We live in a world now where it's not just as simple as I'm a man, here's a problem, I'm going to overcome it. Mm. We now live in a world where there are so many things that are out of our control and to be fair, we have always lived in that world but I feel like now we're much more aware of it 20 years on that there are systemic issues that cannot simply easily be overcome that affect me in my everyday life. Mm. Yeah. And... I think that's a totally fair point. You know, I think it can be demoralizing when you're just like, well, I can't, like, what's the point in solving this problem when there are so many more? Like, there's an in, like, an insurmountable, like, amount of problems. But maybe that is the beauty of this. Well, like, what can I solve? Right. You know, and that would come back, like, just the idea of thinking, well, what, what can I do in my life that I can at least make my, my sphere Mm. Better. Not in a selfish way, but I mean, yeah, like, yeah. what can I do? And I think that's part of that, you know, beauty of that proverb that we read as well. Just, right. well, I can speak up justice. I can focus my energy on positive things. Just because I can't do everything doesn't mean I shouldn't do something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I would say like 
a lot of people, I, I like the media loves to like, not to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but they love to like sensationalize everything. And I think that can become demoralizing because yep. it just feels like there's so many problems and <laughs> maybe we're better off to just stop paying so much attention. Yeah. To, you what know? is it? Fake news travels is six times faster than real news or something oh. like that. Is that fake news? I don't know. <laughs> like, I don't even know if that's true. I don't know. You know, but I, I think maybe we're better off to just say, you know what? I can't do everything, but I can do something. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's so a battle to fight. Is that the first yep, one? Battle to fight. This is my interpretation of it, by the way. Yeah. I'm yeah. not necessarily following. That's what I just people think are here for, Josh. Yeah, yeah. They're here for the Josh translation. <laughs> and then he goes on to a beauty to rescue. Now, I think this may not have aged as well. Not that he words it like this at all, but I think a lot of, I think now we're kind of at a stage where women are like, well, I don't want to be rescued. I'm not a damsel in distress or whatever. Right. Which was also kind of true when he was writing this too, but I think it's probably more, mm. more so the case now. How does he frame it? Well, I, I'm actually, I haven't reread that chapter yet. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. I'm just, yeah. Well, we can, <laughs> That's we'll, like, go, we'll go to a different, what really, what's your, what's your recollection on this one? Oh, look, well, let me just talk about it. I just, this, the concept, I guess. Yeah. Is that I think, well, I think like ultimately men, like what well, we, we all want to find like love and companionship. Right. You know, I think the principle underlying it is obviously good. Like, and I think men, I think, I don't know. I guess men want to feel like they're men love to feel like they're like helping. You yeah. Know? We talk about, this is like the running joke all the time when it's just like when a, when a, like when, you, when a wife tells you like all of their problems, you're not meant to be like, well, here's how you fix it. You know, you're it's really do, annoying yeah. when they do that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, man. but I think that's just the natural instinct is yeah. like, we want to help. We want to yeah. rescue them from like, oh, what they said this year to work. I'll come and, I'll come and show this boy or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Like we, we, we kind of, we, we thrive on that. Whereas um, women tend to be a little bit more relationally oriented where, <laughs> you know, sometimes it's not so much about fixing the problem as it is about being present in the problem. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, true. And so I think, I think that's just like, that's, that's the drive. Yeah. They just want to, and they, they want that, like that, that love to just like go after. And I think that's valid. I think that's still a valid principle in itself that like, and maybe there's a part in there too, that it's just like men also like, you know, that we talk about conquering a challenge mm. and it's like, you can't even make the, not that you're like conquering a woman, but it's like, the idea is like the challenge is, is like, well, I want to be with her. Like, yeah, I'm going to do like whatever it takes to like conquer the challenge of like, you know, but I think being as, worthy of her love. And yeah, you know, I, I do think that it, there is some objectification inherent in that, you know, because as much as we might say, well, I'm not conquering the woman herself. Some might look at that and go, well, yeah, you kind of are in a way. Like it's a, you know, it's a challenge to, get with a certain woman or it's a challenge to, you know, want to try and win a certain type of, of woman, mm. but women may not see it that way. They may, they may see it like, well, you're a creep and I don't want to be with you. So stop yeah. trying. Well, yeah. Like, you know? Yeah. And I think that's something that's been a, a real present conversation recently is just like, well, yeah. respecting. <laughs> I don't know where this delicate. <gasps> respecting the no, you know, respecting yeah. where like. No means no. Yeah. No means no. And that's, that's great. That's true. Yes. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> but I, I think there is still an idea that like, of like, you know, will you, will, will like, I know this is something I do remember from it. It's like, will you fight for her? And yeah. this isn't just saying like, okay. just to get with her, but to stay with her and yeah. to like, like in a marriage, like, will you, will you fight for that marriage to stay yeah. healthy? Like, are you willing to be the kind of guy who's going to keep showing up even when things get tough? Yeah. And this is something we're seeing at the moment It's like, Guys aren't showing up when things get tough. Like when that stuff gets tough in marriage, they're leaving, you yeah. know, or as a, or as a, as a father. And I think this is part of what we want to see, like in our, in our present age is just that commitment. Like, are you willing to commit to this? Yeah. And I think that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. So I guess that's, that's the principle. Like, obviously mm. I'm saying that and I'm not like. No, it's interesting. And I think it, it is very, that it's an interesting conversation when the counterpoint in at least popular media today is preaching the exact opposite. Like, I don't know how many movies I've seen in the last sort of five years where the female characters are often portrayed as being just as capable, if not more capable than the men to the point where 
there have been a number of movies that I've watched recently where the male protagonist is often denigrated and put down for being an idiot or a bumbling oaf when the the female is like elevated of being way more capable than than the man. Yep. And I'm not wanting to go back to that 1950s damsel in distress paradigm where the woman is completely useless and needs the man to rescue her. Yeah. But I do think that we have crossed a bit of a threshold where elevating women as being capable of whatever, whether it be an action movie or, you know, really strong or smart or whatever, has come at the cost of pushing men down. And I just don't think that's necessary. I think you can elevate women and we have been elevating women in our society for a long time now. And that's a good thing, but I don't think it needs to come at the cost of pushing men down, whether that's in movies or whether that's in real life. Yes, I agree. Yeah, I I totally agree. Like I'm thinking back to, (laughs) I don't know if you remember like the, what is it, Scooby-Doo movies? And it's like, oh yeah, Daphne, she's like, yeah. I rolled my ankle. And then it's just like, something will happen and they'll get her out. It's like, I rolled my other ankle. <laughs> and it's like, oh my goodness, come on. Like, this is so ridiculous. Yeah. And look, the last, the last point that he makes is like, men want an adventure to go on. Okay. And I think that's true too. Like, you want to feel like you're living your life with purpose. Now, I'm just like riffing off these titles and some of the ideas in the introduction to the book. Again, I encourage you to read it for yourself. Make your own mind up on it. And it's a good book. You'll, you'll learn things from it for sure. But I think like, and this is sort of meeting back to where we were before, that a lot of men mm. don't feel like they have purpose now. Yep. And I think you want to feel like your life is an adventure. Yeah. Like, and you know, that you're like as a, you know, even in a, a married unit, when you feel like as a family, like, hey, we're on this journey together, this awesome adventure together. You know, for us, we have it in that, in that sense of following Jesus. Like Jesus mm. has a plan for our lives and, and for our marriage and, you know, for our family. And so like he's got us on this adventure and we're following like where the, the spirit leads, where the, where the wind blows our sails. And that's exciting, you know, yeah. to, for, for us at least. Like I feel like I have purpose in life and I know what I'm like, like going for. Mm. Not like super detailed all the time, you know, yeah. but like... For the most part, like the, the I've got big a purpose. picture. Yeah. I think f- the brilliant thing about Christianity is the way that it can frame that for, for men. And I, in many ways, I do genuinely feel sorry for men who don't have faith because mm. there's not that immediate, obvious invitation into the lifetime of adventure that Christianity yeah. does offer. I, I will say, of course. The obvious thing, which is that often Christianity is not framed as an adventure. Often it's framed in much more anemic terms. And I think that's on us to actually resurrect and do it in a way that is healthy and not toxic, but also is inviting and exciting. So, yeah. Well, yeah, that's kind of a big thing that the the book touches on too, is that in many, in many ways, like men, like there's like a wildness in a man Mm. and some, like we kind of just need almost like permission to just like be a bit wild, yeah. you know, to, to have that battle to fight, to like, you know, fight for that woman that you love, to like mm. go on that adventure, what, whatever that looks like. Mm. And sometimes we try and like, yeah, he talks about, he actually had some interesting points about like the church trying to like subdue men in a way. Mm. I don't know. It's, it's a whole thing that I don't know if we can really get too far into. But, <laughs> yeah. But even like we talk about like with education and stuff. Like some like young boys like to move a lot more, you know, <laughs> and they yeah. got a lot more energy yeah. and they got, well, I don't know, maybe more energy, but they, they, yeah, the way well, their body, they, they struggle to sit still longer. Yeah. Testosterone kicks in and then, you know, you don't really, you can't fight it. You know, you have to like, yeah. 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 And, and often that's why like so many young boys are getting, yeah, they're getting, what's the word I'm looking for? Yeah, they're saying they have like ADHD or whatever. Right. And so they're getting sure. like really, and it's like, I don't know, like I'm not a medical <coughs> professional, but it's just like, I have questions about it, I guess. <laughs> but this is the thing, like there's something like, and maybe, I don't know, just to have that like wild and adventurous spirit in us, whatever that looks like, it doesn't mm. necessarily mean that you go out to the bush and like go camping for weeks on end or. Yeah. And I mean, if that's your thing, that's your thing. That's awesome. Yeah. But maybe it's the idea that like God has that wildest, heroic, adventurous spirit mm-hmm. in you as a man 
and uh, he can use that. Yeah. And you have permission for God yeah. to use that. To, I don't know. It just reminds me of, you know, my time in, in chaplaincy, in primary school chaplaincy, and that's your world right now. So you can definitely speak to this better than I can. But I just remember seeing, you know, your seven, eight, nine-year-old boys who have so much energy and so much <laughs> just passion and, mm. and, and excitement and they want to move and they want to jump and run and hit things and climb things and do things. And in school, they're taught to sit down and shut up and be quiet. And I think it's good that there are rules and boundaries in schools. I'm oh, not, yeah, I'm you have not, to learn to do that stuff. You like, have to yeah. learn to do that stuff. But that also needs to be an outlet for yes. that energy. And I think if, if boys are complete, continually told to shut up and sit down and to not be allowed to, to have an outlet for that energy, for that passion, for that, I guess, wildness in their heart, mm. then of course it's going to come out in domestic abuse and wow. or crime or addiction or just anger. You know, all of that stuff is an outlet for that, that desire, that drive. And if we're not provided a healthy outlet, then mm-hmm. it's going to come out in unhealthy ways. That just, yeah. And even that seems obvious. That mentoring process of just being like, "Hey, I know you f- you feel like this. That's normal. Like, yeah, it's okay. Like to like that's how a lot of guys feel. Like, this is how we deal with it. Like yeah. when you you feel angry, you learn to deal with it in healthy ways. And that's I think why mentoring is such an amazing thing. Yeah, like I don't know that I, I would really love to hear other people's opinions. Yeah, on this. it um, feels like just talking about gender and masculinity is enough to get us into trouble. <laughs> Weirdly enough, in, hey, just, yeah. just just going there in general. Yeah, which, why should it? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah I, maybe we will get in trouble. Who knows? But like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I guess, and I'm not saying we have all the answers and I'm, I'm open mm. to learn more. And I, I think at the end of the day, this conversation has to be a collaboration between genders because I think we have as much as men of an obligation to work with women to help them become their best selves. Yes. And at the same time, we need to be humble enough to allow them to help us become our best selves. But the only way that we can do that is by having understanding Mm. and compassion and a genuine desire for the opposite gender to be their best, their best self. Yeah. And I really like what Richard Reeve says in his book, I'm just reading an article from The Guardian that is reviewing it. And he says, the problem with men is typically framed as a problem of men. Mm. It is men who must be fixed one man or boy at a time. This individualist approach is wrong. Instead, I'm reading from the article, he maintains that there are structural problems, societal issues that need to be addressed if men are not to become even more lost, defeated, and angry. So in other words, this is not something that you as an individual can fix. It's something that we as a society can address, but only if we do it together. Yes. I agree with that hundred percent. But what I love the story of Adam and Eve, I'm going to get preachy for a second, right? <laughs> I think there's a pretty bad mistranslation, mistranslation because it doesn't, tra- I can see why it was translated like that, but I, you know, anyway, let me talk. Adam and Eve were both created in the image of God. Yeah, And then we get the more detailed story. like Because in Genesis 2, it talks about man and woman in his image, he created them. Mm. So they're both beholders of the image of God, which is absolutely beautiful compared to other, you know, Near Eastern religions at the time where you had only kings had the image of God, whereas this was just like, you just have it mm. inherently as a human being. Mm. And that's beautiful because God just loves you and bestows upon you his image. In chapter th- 2, sorry, Yep, sorry. In chapter one, that was chapter one. In chapter two, you get a more detailed story about Adam being like formed in the dust and God breathing into his nostrils. And then that it was not good for man to be alone. So God gives him a companion. Now, the English translation often says that he took Adam's rib. Mm. Yeah. Which makes it sound like woman is kind of like. Like an afterthought. Yeah, like one part of man yeah. coming out. The actual Hebrew word there, if you're going to, tra- and this is why they translate it side because it doesn't really make much sense. As they, This is why they translate it as rib because it doesn't make so much sense, but it would be like his entire side. Mm. Like his, it's like half of him was, it was like he was split in half to create two. 
So it's not like Eve is one part of Adam. It's actually that Adam was in two parts. Like man was in two, like divided in half. And that's the beauty of mm. like we're both halves of this beautiful picture called humanity made mm. in God's image. And we both bear the image of God, one in the masculine sense, one in the feminine sense. So both are beautiful. And it makes total sense why then the text goes on to say this is why a man leaves his parents, cleaves to his wife. I don't know if that's the right yes. word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they become one flesh. So it's yeah. like the two halves are coming back together to form a whole. Yeah, yeah. And that's, that's why it's so important for us to all work together on, on like on this and still to be able to talk about this yeah. without it being a controversial issue, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I should also point out in that passage the word that is used to describe the woman is often translated as a helper. Mm. But the better translation I've found is that someone who corresponds to the other. So somebody who is like made for the other. Mm. Interestingly, that Hebrew word for helper is most often used to describe God. Mm. And the other translation that you can use is salvation. Yeah. Well, so pretty significant. Yeah. And not a subordinated position is the main point. Yes. Yeah. It's like it was his, it, it rescued him from the loneliness. And that's the thing, yeah. like, again, we, we didn't even really touch on this, but there is like a lonely, loneliness issue with yeah, men. Yeah, of course. Like men, are, men are more lonely at the moment. And yeah. again, Reeves talks about that in his study. Like it's, it's brutal. So you've got these guys who are purposeless, struggling and lonely. <laughs> <laughs> like a lethal a, combination. It really is. Yeah. And so I just want to, this is why I just want to start this conversation. You know, a little while ago we had a, a men's ministry, like a men's barbecue, the classic, <laughs> um, you know, run by like our conference. And I was there and it was actually so nice to just like hang out, you know, with other guys. And that's kind of, you know, I was challenged at that to, to talk about masculinity. And so I was like, you know what? Probably should actually, mm. it's a good idea. I want to hear your thoughts. Don't just get mad at us for the sake of getting mad at us. Talk about it. Like, let's just, let's have some conversations around maybe the future around this and what we can do and what does masculinity mean to you? Mm. What does it mean to be man? And, and what is it? Yeah. I don't know. We've presented some ideas from that Proverbs 31 and from Wild at Heart and just from our own personal anecdotes. <laughs> yeah. that's, what, that's what the people are here for. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Not the the hunting elk pod, podcast. <laughs> that would be the day. Yeah. <laughs> I'd feel too bad. I don't want to hunt anything. Yeah. They're such beautiful. Anyway, yeah. too soft. Too soft in my heart. <laughs> Photography. That'd be the way. Yeah. I hunt them with my camera. Yeah. That'd be. Can I, I share a quick anecdote? Sure. <laughs> sure. I recently had the opportunity to hunt pigs. <laughs> really? Yeah, I went to a farm a few weeks ago. Wow! Um, because one of our Avondale College friends, university Avondale University friends, you. is now a farmer's wife, huh. and uh, she lives out in the middle of rural New South Wales. Hey. Beautiful spot, beautiful farm. Unfortunately, one of the biggest pests is wild pigs, wild hogs. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So it's a, it's a yeah they they tear up the the ground and it's pretty bad. Yeah. yeah. I went on a little bit of a photography excursion. Oh yeah, into a paddock because I wanted to get some star trails. Oh okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. And while I was out there, I got a phone call from Karina, my wife, and she said, "Look, don't panic, but such and such the husband has put on his infrared binoculars and he's seen that there's some pigs in the paddock where you are." And I said, "Okay, you say don't panic, but should I actually Panic? Should I leave? Because it's there's a big difference between if there's a sow and her piglets in the paddock versus like a I don't know what you call a a boar. Yeah, maybe no. I think a boar is a specific species. Okay, but okay, let's say a boar because that sounds sensational. But like a man, (laughs) a daddy pig, (laughs) daddy pig, daddy, daddy pig, daddy pig. You know the ones with the tusks, right? Yeah, and the big and the big hairy brindles and all that sort of stuff. So. I quickly packed up my stuff and I, and I headed out and a farmer man comes down and he says, Hey, do you want to go out and shoot the pig with me? And I had a moment. I was like, I can, like I've shot, I've shot things before. (gasps) I will admit I've shot kangaroos and I've shot birds and stuff. You are hectic. Yeah. But I feel bad about it. 
That's my problem. Oh, I'm a, I'm it's, a far, it's farm life, man. I'm a, you gotta I do know. what you gotta do. You gotta, yeah. I know. See, okay. this is the thing. Like, yep. I'm a city boy now. I'm, yeah, yeah. I, I was a farmer kid, but now I'm a city boy and I feel bad about shooting stuff. But at the same time, I understand, yeah, you got to do it. Mm-hmm. I did decline and he went and shot them and he sent me a photo. So that was nice. <laughs> that was my anecdote. So <laughs> sent you a photo? Yeah, that was an experience. Anyway, sorry for the diversion. <laughs> no, I appreciate it. That was, yeah. 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 There you go. Yeah. So, like, what happens if you're out on a farm and then there's like a, Pig stampede or something. Does that happen? Uh, no, most of the time they run away from you. Oh, okay. Because they don't want to get in your business. They'll go and go into a bush or something like that or a, a creek bed or something like that where there's cover. Oh, uh, okay. But you don't want to get close to them. You definitely don't want to get close to them. Yeah. Big, they're they're pretty boys. heavy. They're pretty heavy and they'll, they, they can do some damage. Yeah. I remember when my friends went on a mission trip to the South America, they were in the Amazon. Oh, yeah. And you had to sleep on, they had to sleep in hammocks. Ah, because if you sleep on the ground, the wild boars like run over you and yep. kill you and whatever. So yeah, you sleep in the trees. Yep. So pretty, pretty hectic. I just assumed it was like that. I just assumed there's random boar stampedes. This is not the Lion King, but that would be interesting. <laughs> was that wildebeest? Wildebeest. Yeah. Yeah. Same, same as a boar, right? Exactly the same. <laughs> There'd be some listener right now who's just like grinding their teeth just in frustration <laughs> at our lack of animal knowledge. Unreasonably angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Anyway, sorry to divert, but I just thought I should share that. Thanks. Um, no, I appreciate it. I think it really made the episode. <laughs> <laughs> hey, no, but hey, we're looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this, guys. Especially, you know, those of you in the Burn the Haystack community group. Yeah, get the conversation started. Um, yeah, anything to add? Any more anecdotes you want to add, Jesse? I think I, I, I've said enough for one day. All right. <laughs> All right, awesome. Well, hey, we love you guys. You are awesome. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. That is Josh and Jesse out.